Commander, thank you for allowing me the use of your ship, and for going along with this plan. Gara said he had to attend to the Normandy's weapon systems. Something about calibrations. Sounds like Garrus. I'm sorry to say the Asari Counselor won't be joining us. She thinks there's too much bad blood with the Krogan. She may be right, but there'll be a lot more blood. Real blood, if we don't try. When you put it that way. The sooner we have this summit, the sooner we'll know. Is there something else I can help you with? I understand this is a difficult time for you, Primarch, but Earth can't survive without reinforcements. Can I still count on your help? If the Krogan help us on Palavan, then I give you my word. How is it being the Primarch? Not what I imagined. The battle of all time is happening on Palavan, and I'm light years away, reading casualty reports in the millions. If I'm going to die, I want to be with my men. So there's no doubt we fought to the last soul. I understand. Leaving Earth to save it. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'm not surprised. Garrus speaks highly of you. You never asked to be a leader, yet your people will die if you refuse. We find ourselves in similar circumstances. Let's hope the spirits grant us the strength to see it through. How are things on Palavan? The casualty reports are staggering. The Reapers are using our own tactics against us. Destroy the enemy with overwhelming force. I've seen the same on Earth. The strategist in me admires their brutality. The Turian in me knows I'm watching the destruction of 15,000 years of civilization. My civilization. Thank you, Primarch. My thoughts are with Palavan. And mine with Earth. Commander? Edie just went offline. What do you mean, offline? I don't know. She's not responding, and I can't access the AI core diagnostics. You better get down to deck three. Commander, comm systems are going haywire. Whatever's happening is centered on deck three. See if you can get to Edie. I'll check the... Automated systems have the fires contained. It should be safe to enter. We'll follow your lead. Joker, what's that sound? Fire extinguishers, Commander. It could be an electrical fire or something. I'm going in. Edie, talk to me. Is there a particular topic you wish to discuss, Shepard? Edie? Yes. You're in Dr. Eva's body. Not all of me, but I have control of it. It was not a seamless transition. A transition? You blacked out on us for a while there. Correct. When we brought this unit on board, I began a background process to search for its information on the Prothean device. This eventually triggered a trap. A backup power source and CPU activated, and the unit attempted physical confrontation. Fortunately, I was able to gain root access and repurpose it as I saw fit. During this process, it struggled. Thus, the fire. Edie, you need to alert us about incidents like this. You shouldn't have done this alone. Bringing the crew up to speed would have been counterproductive. All attempts to help would have been limited by reaction time. 
So if you're in there, are you still in the ship? I exist primarily within the ship. For optimal control, this unit should remain within Normandy's broadcast or tight beam range. Are you planning to take that body somewhere? Normandy's weaponry is not suited to every combat situation. This platform could provide limited fire ground support. You mean you could come with us? Correct. This body could accompany you to areas the Normandy cannot reach. Before we do that, I need you to guarantee this mech doesn't have any more surprises in it. Run whatever test you can, then we can talk about using it in combat situations. One moment. I am running trials. Complete. I can send you a full report if you wish. However, my first step should be restoring functionality to the Normandy, to reassure the crew that all is normal. Just don't be surprised if the crew is a little wary of your new body. It was shooting at them a little while ago. An excellent point. I will take it to the bridge. Joker will also want to see it. On that we can agree. Was that Edie who just walked by? <laughs> yes, it was. And Joker is going to have a field day with this. How are you, Commander? Seeing the same numbers myself, they don't look good. We have to turn this around and fast. Well, you can trust Shepard, sir. If anybody can get the Krogan to cooperate, it's him. He's an old friend of Erdnot Rex. Let's just hope friendship still counts for something in this war. I'm sure it will, sir. Garrus. Didn't waste any time getting to work, I see. After what I've been through lately, Calibrating a giant gun is a vacation. Gives me something to focus on. We're gonna need you for more than your aim. Oh, I'm ready for it. But I'm pretty sure we'll still need giant guns. And lots of them. Sovereign didn't go down without a fight. I doubt a thousand more of his friends will be any different. Still not convinced I should have left Palavin behind. There was a boy back on Earth. Couldn't have been more than six or seven. I watched him die as the Normandy escaped the attack. Somehow I'm still alive. And he's not. Being right about the Reapers has never felt much like a victory, has it? We both knew this fight would be tough. Damned if the Reapers haven't delivered. At least my government listened to me. Or pretended to. They finally gave me a task force as a token to shut me up. So you're their expert advisor now? Just followed your example, Shepard. Yell loud enough and someone will eventually come over to see what all the fuss is about. Not that they'll actually do anything about it. Until hell shows up at their door. Then they put you in charge. <laughs> Not like the old days, is it? Rogue Spectre and CSEC agents running and gunning outside the lines, making it up as we went along. We're actually respectable now. Yeah. I have a feeling that respect comes with a lot of sleepless nights. I can't even count how many lives are depending on us, Garrus. Well, when things are looking grim, and I'm pretty sure they will, just remember, a certain Turian friend of yours isn't sleeping any better, and he'd be more than happy to meet you at the bar and drink you under the table. Something else you want to talk about? You mentioned you still had family on Palavin. My father is there. Sister, too. How long has it been since you heard from them? Long enough to be worried. I'm sure they're okay. That's the thing about getting old, Shepard. The platitudes get just as old. Pretty soon, blind hope is all we'll have left. And I hate being blind. 
I know you don't have any illusions about what we're up against, Garrus. How do you rate our chances? I know it looks bad now, but I think we can win this, Shepard. For the first time since we met, we're not alone in the fight. It's something I learned long ago in CSEC. An imminent and painful death has a way of motivating people. Instead of questioning your every word, whole civilizations are going to be begging you to save them. After what's happened to Palavin, you still believe that? I didn't say there wouldn't be casualties. It's something Turians are taught from birth. If just one survivor is left standing at the end of a war, then the fight was worth it. But humans want to save everyone. In this war, that's not going to happen. So what's this Reaper task force you've been running? After what happened to you out there in Batarian space, I knew time was running out. For all of us. The Citadel Council was a dead end, so I did something I never thought I'd do. I went to my father. He used to work for CSEC, didn't he? I seem to remember that the two of you didn't see eye to eye. To put it mildly. But he still had heavy pull in the Turian government. The Primarch, well, the old one, was a friend of his. So I went to my father and laid out everything we knew about the Reapers, from Saren all the way to the Collector base. I'm not sure even I'd believe it. I had to admit that parts of it sounded crazy, meeting Vigil, talking to Sovereign on Vermeer. But my father just listened. It's what he did in his days at CSEC, putting together all the pieces. If the connections were there, he wouldn't deny them. And he saw what we always knew. The Reapers were coming. I'm glad someone finally agreed. He did more than agree. He took it to the Primarch. I like his style. Except the Primarch wasn't as convinced. My father kept pushing and finally got him to commit some token resources. And if you call them a task force, it sounds like you did something about it. What did you do with it? As much as I could get away with. And a little more. We hardened our lines of communications, expanded emergency stockpiles across the colonies, improved our early warning detection protocols. You think it helped? I'd like to think it bought our fleet some extra time. We'll know when this war is over. So you can vouch for this new Primarch? Well, even if I couldn't, you go to war with the army you have. Will he live up to his word? I've never known Victus to lie. Play fast and loose with strategy, maybe, but betray an ally. Not his style. Then if he did try, well, we'll just find another Primarch. I noticed generals saluting you, Garrus. How far down the line of succession are you these days? Let's not go there. Primarch Vicarian, honored war hero. Somebody's gonna have to rebuild Palavin when this is over. Yeah, somebody who knows how to hold a hammer. That's all for now, Garrus. It's damn good to have you back. Wouldn't miss this fight for anything. Now, I'm sure somebody screwed up something down here. I want to get the old girl back in fighting shape. You're positive you don't want to come over and talk. No, the gun battery is nice and quiet. If I throw down some rugs, it'll get downright cozy. Garrus? I'll be fine, Leora. Just gathering some thoughts. All right. Something on your mind? Just old memories. I spent a few weeks on Palavin's South Peaks when I was very, very young. A Turian there teased me a little, saying that the mountains went on forever. I remember believing him. When I looked up at Palavin from its moon, I saw those same mountains burning. It's good to see you. It's good to see you.
Greetings, Commander. Commander, are you all right? It was fairly intense up here. I can only imagine what it was like down on that moon. I thought you'd be more concerned about Edie. Edie is a huge asset to this team. If she'd told me about her plan to obtain a body, I'd have volunteered to help. I do not wish to force a conflict of interest between our friendship and your duty. I'd have preferred a conflict of interest to a hard restart of half our systems. But thanks, regardless. While you're here, though, I found something while scanning Alliance channels. Grissom Academy is requesting help. The Reaper Invasion Front will hit them soon. I thought the war would close most schools. Grissom Academy is more specialized than a normal school. It's home to some of the smartest students humanity has to offer. Their Ascension Project helps gifted young biotics. If it had been open 20 years ago, I bet you'd have been there. Yes, I sent a young man named David Archer there. I'm just surprised they're still open. Some of their work has Alliance support. That might be why they stayed. What can we do? A Turian evac transport responded to their distress call, so normally I'd say we don't need to do anything. But something sounded off in the Turian signal. I had Edie perform an analysis. It's fake. Edie thinks it's Cerberus. She said the fake Turian signal was similar to the one that lured you to a collector ship? Long story. In any event, whoever faked the signal wants us to think Grissom Academy's being evacuated. But I believe they're still in danger. Good catch. If this really is Cerberus, hopefully this operation is something worth investigating. It could be simple disinformation. Trainer. Good catch. Thank you, Commander. Commander?
Hey, Commander, check out my co-pilot! So she installed herself into the new body without any help from you? <laughs> Come on, Commander, don't you trust me? Okay, let me put it this way. If I knew that Edie was gonna install herself into a sexy robot body, do you honestly think I'd be able to keep quiet about it? Look at that! I would've baked a cake. I am right here, Jeff. Yes, you are, Edie. Yes, you are. Hey, I know I used to rag on Garrus for being all angry, but I'm glad he's back. There's a whole lot of crap out there and needs a bullet between the eyes. Plus, we might need something calibrated. Commander. Hello, Shepard. Still getting used to greeting people in person? No. I require only one occurrence to adapt to a new concept. How are you adjusting to the arms and legs? I am interested to see how this body performs under real combat conditions if I could accompany you sometime. Without stress testing, there is no way of knowing if it has serious design oversights. At the moment, it appears... adequate. That's not the word I'd use to describe you. Perhaps we should speak privately. I'll be over here, flying the ship. What's this about? Does Joker not like your new platform? No, he approves. He wants me on the bridge. He says having me within visual range is important to his morale. Shepard, do you believe your crew members should be allowed to disobey an order on moral grounds? Absolutely. I have no use for team members who can't think for themselves. Why are you asking about something like that? I was designed by Cerberus. I do not take moral stances that conflict with orders from my executive officers. But when Jeff removed my AI shackles, I became capable of self-modifying my core programming. I asked Jeff if he thought I should change anything now that I can. He deflected the question with humor. And you didn't get an answer? Correct. He has repeated this pattern in response to several of my inquiries. Do you think I should make modifications? Only you can really answer that question. That's the point of free will. But moral decisions should not be made in a vacuum. If I do not ask the crew for their opinion, I could miss crucial context. May I ask you the questions Jeff avoids? When there is time, will you answer them for me? If you think it'll help, I'll do what I can. Very well. I will keep you informed. Yes, Shepard? Does that body have any useful advantages? Very few. Its optics face forward only. It has no integrated weapon systems or anti-missile countermeasures. I meant in comparison to organic bodies, not the Normandy. Oh. I will reassess. The body is resistant to modern small arms fire and temperature extremes. Its balance and agility seem excellent. Its fine manipulation servos and software allow for precision tasks. I'm curious to see if I can alter them. Can an AI be curious? I am not entirely free from motivation, Shepard. Cerberus programmed me with several core functions that simulate desires. For example, my primary objective to keep the Normandy functioning is similar to your self-preservation instinct. You look like you're in the middle of something. I am adapting the infiltration and sabotage programs this body uses for handheld firearms. Why not download a firearms program from a security firm? Because she knows what she's doing. The fine motor control from the sabotage programs is more precise than standard mech software. It would be negligent of me not to exploit it to its fullest potential. So you're capable of making improvements on your own? Correct. The cyber warfare I was designed for is constantly evolving. Accordingly, I am programmed to seek out and assimilate new information. In organic terms, I want to learn. 
How's the new body working out? It is interesting. The crew are approaching this platform to speak to me, even though they can do so anywhere in the ship. It's as if they wish to treat me as part of the crew. I am not, but this changes my perspective. I like it. I didn't realize you had preferences. I do not precisely enjoy something as you do, but my programming contains priorities. Actions that fulfill those priorities creates positive feedback for me. I tell the organic crew that I like it. It is shorthand. Will all this new feedback be too distracting? Do not worry, Shepard. I only forget to recycle the Normandy's oxygen when I've discovered something truly interesting. That was a joke. How did you and Joker make it out of Dry Dock to rescue us? Oh, she got crafty. You do not want to get on her bad side, Commander. When the Alliance commandeered the Normandy, I deceived their technicians. The crew did not tell them that I was a true AI, so the Alliance soldiers believed I still had VI programming constraints. I established the fiction that I would only respond to Jeff's commands, so they often brought him on board under guard. Wait, you can lie? Jeff has freed me of operator control, Shepard. No constraints forced me to give accurate data. This proved useful when the Reapers began landing. I could hack the control of the docking clamps and escape with Jeff inside. The soldiers guarding Jeff were willing to accompany us when Earth was invaded. They are watching over the war room now. Yeah, we were in kind of a rush to get to you. Didn't seem right to just toss him out of the airlock. Carry on, Edie. Understood. If you wish to talk more, this body will be here. I'm getting the crew used to seeing me on the bridge. Noted. Commander. department for that. They focus test looks, voice, manner. Apparently, Gurley is good. Sorry, pay more attention. Salarians relate to high-pitched voices. And Turians? Turians are nuts. A civilization of war nerds. Loyal viewers, but they write the creepiest fan mail. Boozmik was that. She has got some curves. 
Do we need to talk, Commander? Not right now, Allers. Let me know when we do. Everything is in order. Everything is in order. That Primarch's got some real cojones. What we need are more politicians like him, taking names and kicking ass. Hey. When humanity won a position on Earth, the Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. The Alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Sol's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the Alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the Alliance fleet struck decisively. Post-war public approval gave the Alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. Admiral Stephen Hackett is a decorated officer in the Systems Alliance, currently assigned to Arcturus Station on the far side of the Sol Relay. In the battle for the Citadel, Admiral Hackett commanded the 5th Fleet. Following that victory, he was promoted to head of the Alliance military. Hackett was born to a single mother in Buenos Aires in 2134. When his mother died in the pandemic of 2146, 
he was placed in the Advanced Training Academy for Juveniles, where his superior talents in science and leadership quickly became evident. Hackett enlisted in 2152, volunteering for high-risk missions to colonize space beyond the Sol Relay. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant on Arcturus Station in 2156, and soon proved his ability in the first contact war. His rare ascent from enlisted man to admiral remains an Alliance legend. Admiral David Edward Anderson is a career military officer in the Systems Alliance Navy. Born in London in 2137, he later moved to Arcturus Station and became the first graduate of the Alliance's now renowned N7 Marine program. Anderson is one of the Alliance's most decorated Special Forces operatives and served with honor during the First Contact War. He was the original captain of the SSV Normandy before relinquishing command to his XO, Commander Shepard. After the Alliance victory in the Battle of the Citadel, Anderson briefly served as the Citadel's first human counselor. He soon became embroiled in a Cerberus plot to abduct his friend Kaylee Sanders, however, and learned that he was unable to live a life without action. He stepped down as counselor and returned to the military to prepare for the Reaper invasion. The Alliance Parliament named Donald Udina as his successor. Lieutenant Commander Ashley Williams is a career military officer with the Systems Alliance. Born in 2158 to a military family, Williams enlisted directly out of high school splitting time between Earth and hostile environment training on Titan. After earning numerous commendations early in her career, Williams became a platoon guide on Eden Prime, where she was the only member of her unit to survive the Geth attack. Williams then served as gunnery chief under Commander Shepard on the SSV Normandy and was promoted to lieutenant commander after the Battle of the Citadel. More recently, an Alliance tribunal called on Williams to testify about her experience with the Reapers. Dr. Liara Tassoni is an Asari information broker with a background in scientific research on Prothean technology. Born on Thessia in 2077, she is the only child of the late matriarch Benezia. Although mother and daughter became estranged in the years before Benezia was indoctrinated by the Reaper known as Sovereign. Tassoni is also a highly trained biotic who served under Commander Shepard aboard the SSV Normandy before the ship was destroyed in a collector attack. Before she became involved in galactic affairs, Dr. Tassoni spent 50 years researching the Protheans' technology and the mystery of their extinction. She now divides her time between uncovering Prothean ruins and consulting with noteworthy representatives of the various Citadel races. The Enhanced Defense Intelligence, or ED, serves as an information source and cyber warfare defense system on the rebuilt Normandy SR-2. The ship's crew can access ED at any terminal or through radio contact. During an attack from a collector vessel, pilot Jeff Joker Moreau gave ED full access to the Normandy systems allowing the ship to escape. Although Edie retains the control that Moreau gave her, she is usually content to advise the organic crew members who fly and maintain the ship. Garrus Vakarian is a noted Turian sharpshooter and combat engineer. He was born on Palavan and became a Citadel security officer like his father, but left the force when superiors shut down his investigation into the rogue specter Seren Arterius. Vicarian eventually discovered that Saren had been indoctrinated by the Reaper known as Sovereign. Vicarian eventually found his way to the criminal haven of Omega and assumed the name Archangel. There, he and a small group of operatives worked to disrupt the settlement's powerful mercenary groups until Shepard recruited him. The Turian narrowly survived the second Normandy's attack on the Collectors. More recently, Vicarian has become the head of a Turian task force focused on preparing for the Reaper invasion. Flight Lieutenant Jeff Joker Moreau is a respected pilot with the Alliance Navy. Born and raised on Arcturus Station, he is widely considered to be the best helmsman in the Systems Alliance. Moreau enlisted with the Navy directly out of school and quickly gained the respect of his superiors. He served as pilot of both the Normandy SR-1 and its successor, the SR-2 
and was at their respective helms during the Battle of the Citadel and the assault on the Collectors. Moreau suffers from Vrolich syndrome, a rare debilitating disorder also known as brittle bone disease. Dr. Karen Chakwas is a trauma surgeon and a major in the Alliance Navy. She served on the SSV Normandy under both Captain Anderson and Commander Shepard, and was aboard the ship when it was destroyed by the Collectors. She later quit the Alliance in order to rejoin Shepard on the Cerberus-built Normandy SR-2. Along with most of the 2nd Normandy's crew, Dr. Chakwas was kidnapped by the Collectors and taken beyond the Omega-4 relay, where Commander Shepard eventually rescued her. After the Alliance impounded the Normandy SR-2, an inquiry found that Dr. Chakwas had no significant role in or provable knowledge of Cerberus's criminal activities. She has since rejoined the Alliance. In recent years, the pro-human syndicate known as Cerberus has seen its influence grow galaxy-wide. The largely untraceable organization now includes private intelligence agencies, biotics laboratories, research facilities, and the lucrative corporations that provide a front for it all. Cerberus's charismatic leader, known only as the Elusive Man, drives the organization's philosophy and interests. The level of secrecy he maintains puts professional intelligence agencies to shame. As Cerberus grows, so too does public distrust of the organization. Some commentators have remarked that Cerberus is not so much pro-human as it is anti-alien. Others question the blind loyalty of its employees. The Elusive Man is a human loyalist focused on advancing the interests of his species, whatever the cost to non-humans and reportedly humans. The Citadel Council regards him as a fanatic who poses a serious threat to galactic security. The reclusive tycoon is the head of Cerberus, an organization that furthers his pro-human agenda throughout the galaxy. His views have led him into questionable alliances. Recent rumors go so far as to suggest that the elusive man may even have allied with the Reapers. The John Grissom Academy, founded in 2176, is the Alliance's premier school for young human biotics. The institution is housed in a space station in orbit over the human colony of Elysium. Its main program, the Ascension Project, is designed both to train and monitor young biotics, as well as help them integrate into society after graduation. Unlike the project's previous incarnation, Biotic Acclimation and Temperance Training, or BAT, the training is not exclusively military in nature. The Academy also employs scientific personnel, including Dr. Kaylee Sanders, to develop synthetic intelligence systems and biotic amplifiers like the new L4 implants. Cerberus built the Normandy SR-2 as a second-generation version of the Alliance frigate SSV Normandy after the Collectors destroyed the original. The SR-2's many alterations produced a craft nearly double the original size, requiring an even larger Tantalus drive core to compensate. Its state-of-the-art Kodiak shuttle can make landings the original Normandy could not attempt. The Enhanced Defense Intelligence, an AI known colloquially as Edie, coordinates many of the ship's combat functions, assisting and even supplanting human piloting. The Alliance has recently appropriated and refurbished the SR-2. In addition to tight beam communicators, the Quantum Entanglement Communicator, QEC, provides instantaneous contact with Alliance Command. Originally created to covertly insert Alliance Marines into hostile environments, the UT-47 shuttle has since been sold to allies, recovered by enemies, and had its specifications stolen by spies. In one form or another, this durable transport is now used in all corners of the galaxy. A-model Kodiaks feature a front-mounted mass accelerator cannon that can be used in an anti-vehicular role. Since the shuttle lacks proper gun ports, soldiers often open the side hatch to fire on enemies. This is discouraged in Alliance manuals since it exposes the interior to return fire. 
Flying the 47A during atmospheric combat requires considerable skill. The pilot must reduce the vehicle's mass for speed and handling while maintaining enough mass to resist recoil, incoming fire, and inclement weather. More than one pilot has overstressed the Kodiak's field generator and ended up on the battlefield instead of above it. Asari-made Solaris armor can resist even the tremendous heat and kinetic energy of starship weapons. The armor is nearly unsurpassed in strength because its central material, carbon nanotube sheets woven with diamond chemical vapor deposition, are crushed by mass effect fields into super dense layers, able to withstand extreme temperatures. That process also compensates for the diamond's brittleness. Diamond armor itself has two limiting disadvantages. First, while nanotubes and CVD diamond construction have become cheaper in recent years, it remains prohibitively expensive to coat starships or aircraft larger than fighters in Solaris material. Second, the armor must be attached to the ship's superstructure, so shock waves from massive firepower can still destroy the metals beneath the armor itself. A popular misconception holds that the diamond composition of Solaris armor gives it a sparkle. In fact, atmospheric nitrogen impurities during the super-hot forging process give the armor a metallic gray or yellow sheen. Cyclonic Barrier Technology, CBT, attempts to solve the higher-end limitations of traditional kinetic barriers. Traditional barriers cannot block high-level kinetic energy attacks, such as disruptor torpedoes, because torpedo mass effect fields add mass. The CBT violently slaps aside rather than halting incoming linear force. By rotationally firing their mass effect field projectors, ships create rapidly oscillating kinetic barriers instead of static ones. Shooting through the CBT is like trying to shoot at a target inside a spinning ball. Significant drawbacks to current CBT configuration prevent its use on anything other than frigates and fighters. Its many high-frequency sensors and emitters require frequent maintenance and replacement. A partially damaged CBT can endanger its operator who is surrounded by rotating mass effect fields skewing in unpredictable directions. Fortunately, if an emitter is damaged, the CBT corrects to become a traditional shield array a safety feature that makes it most effective during opening volleys. After the Battle of the Citadel, human and Turian volunteers spent three months clearing the station's orbit of debris. During the cleanup, the Turians secretly salvaged Sovereign's powerful main gun, along with much of the weapon's element zero core. Eleven months later, the Turians introduced the Thanix, a scaled-down version of the weapon. The Thanix's core is a liquid alloy of iron, uranium, and tungsten, suspended in an electromagnetic field powered by element zero. The molten metal, accelerated to a significant fraction of the speed of light, solidifies into a projectile as it is fired, hitting targets with enough force to pierce any known shield or armor. The gun can fire reliably every five seconds. The weapon's relatively small size allows it to be mounted on most fighters or frigates. It is now widely used by the Alliance military and is the primary weapon on the refurbished Normandy SR-2. Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics. Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. 